Hello, I'm Andy Briggs and welcome to The Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre or simply interesting. Welcome, dear listeners, to the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet with me, Andy, and uh, Daz. How are you, Daz? Uh, Very cold. Um, I was going to say, you've got a a sheepskin coat on there. What's going on? (laughs) Are you out out sheeping, inverted commas? No, 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 no sheeping at all. I'm being sheepish. Uh, No, it's um, basically, I've just come back from Lanzarote and the temperature here has plummeted. Um, I've just got off the motorbike as well after being at work. Um, I'm going to have to get some better gloves. Um, but my oh, hands are really whiskey. Sort of whiskey. Um, I think they frown upon that. On a, you know, he's with a straw, <laughs> in the pocket, you know, yeah. so they frown upon well. that. But, it, but officer, it keeps me uh, like awake. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. other than that, yeah, so everything's fine. Um, had a nice holiday, and uh, Good. of course, Good. you've been away. And uh, yeah, we must we must apologise to our listeners that we haven't uh, recorded yeah. an, an edition of the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet the last couple of weeks because we've both been away. Daz has been in Lanzarote. I was in Ireland and then Wales. Uh, so we've been travelling about a bit, but we're back now and uh, raring to go at bringing you some more yes, uh, amazing, are. interesting and just plain weird facts about the universe. This week, we're tackling the sinuous curves of the letter S. Uh, I hope you agree with that, Daz, because I, I, I reckon... I thought sensuous. Sensuous, <laughs> curves. sensuous curves of the letter S, yes. <laughs> OK, um, so we'll crack right on with it. And I believe it's my turn to go first this week. It certainly is. and I'm looking forward to this. Come on. Uh, so my first one, S is for Carl Schwarzschild. Now, <laughs> Schwarzschild was um, a German physicist born in 1873 and uh, died in 1916. He fought in the First World War. He was at the Russian front. And you will often hear it read that he he suffered injuries at the Russian front because he died in 1916. Well, he did die in 1916, uh, but that wasn't why he died. While he was at the Russian front, he developed an autoimmune disease called uh, Pemphigus which um, is actually it actually affects people um, of um, a particular Jewish origin. It's called Ashkenazi uh, Jewish. And it's uh, this particular ethnic group suffer from this autoimmune disease. And he died from complications of it in 1916. So it wasn't actually anything to do with the uh, with with serving in the war. Why do we remember Karl Schwarzschild? Well, as you may know, In 1915, Einstein brought out his famous uh, theory of general relativity. And Schwarzschild, while he was at the front, while he was at the Russian front, while the bombs were falling around him, got a bit bored and decided that he would solve Einstein's field equations, or at least some of them. Uh, And what leapt out of the equations, and I just have this image of this man sitting there poring over (laughs) equations and reading books, while the shells are falling all around him and not, not giving a damn, yeah. you know, men, perhaps men were made of sterner stuff in those days. I don't know. Yeah. But while he was uh, poring over this, what popped out of the equations was the existence of, or the possible existence of a compact object, which does not radiate any electromagnetic radiation. And this was, of course, a black hole. black hole. And it came directly out of Einstein's equations. Even Einstein at that point hadn't fully realized the implications of relativity. It was still very new, of course, and only a couple of people in the world actually understood relativity, and uh, including Einstein, luckily. But he hadn't seen this in the equations. So Carl Schwarzschild was the first one to put black holes on a, um, a, on a mathematical footing based on, on Einstein. The other thing that he is famous for with regards to black holes is the thing called the Schwarzschild radius which is basically the radius of the black hole. It's the distance from the center of the black hole to the event horizon of uh, the black hole. And that's known as the Schwarzschild radius. And it's such a shame 
that Schwarzschild died when he did because he was, by all accounts, a brilliant mathematician and physicist, died very young. And uh, one wonders what would, he would have gone on to achieve if he, if he could solve Einstein's field equations just a year after, or less than a year after relativity came out, uh, general relativity came out. If he could have done that, one wonders what he might have achieved had he lived. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a real shame. Um, and um, so, yes, so he did all that while he was in the German army at, at the Russian front. And this so, is in um, WW1, is it? WW1, yes. He died in yeah. 1916. Yeah, well, uh, actually thinking about it, you, yeah, you did mention 1915, 16. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so, yeah. So that was a sad loss to science. It but he is remembered, he is remembered yeah. in, in the Schwarzschild radius. He also mm. has an asteroid named after him and a crater on the far side of the moon named after him. So, on the far side? <laughs> yes, on the far side, yes. Yeah, um, so um, so uh, that's how we remember him. So that's that's yeah. basically my first one, Carl Schwarzschild. When you, when you said about the, the Carl Schwarzschild, I thought that name rings a bell. And then yeah. you were talking about uh, the Russian front and all that. And I thought, yeah, mm. I have heard of this chap. Yeah. And yes, he, like you said, he, did, um, he meddled with... Uh, Einstein's equations, and uh, I can remember. Yeah, he, he was the chap who who predicted or uh, surmised that there was this object just from the calculations. So yeah, absolutely. So, uh, that that sort of goes along the lines of um, standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, it does indeed. Uh, so it I think indeed. that might be included in uh, in one of my talks. So, but yeah, he wa he does. wasn't the first person to come up with the idea of the black hole. Um, it had been come, it had come up with long before that, but he was the first person really to observe it in Einstein's equations as yeah. a re, as a potential real object. And of course, even you know, many decades after he died, people were still denying that black holes existed. Yeah, even though the math said they did, uh, it wouldn't be the first time that maths had been wrong, of course. But uh, even today, even now, we have an actual image of a black hole, the, the black hole in M87. Even now. I come across people who still refuse to believe that black holes exist. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, it, uh, some people are just, you just can't get through to them. So, you know, yeah. if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. Unless and, it's invisible. Uh, unless it's, invisible it's an invisible duck. duck yeah. Indeed. Um, yeah. Cause um, yeah, you're saying that. Cause I think going back, it may have been, I don't know whether it was P or whatever. I, I spoke of um, two chaps. One was a Frenchman. One was um, uh, an Englishman, a, a rector of all things. Uh, and they had, uh, I think it was about um, end of the 1600s, 1700s. They had also mm. predicted uh, these things that would be, which were black. Yes, they called good. them black stars. You remember? Yes, that's right. They did. Oh, they, yeah. they called them black stars. Yeah, um, so... Uh, it's, it's amazing how these people can... I mean, they didn't even have Einstein's equations to work with. No, they didn't. They didn't. Um, so, and you know, it's, it's just these people. people can absolutely think outside the box, and you've never heard of them. So this is why, you know, it's... Uh, we, we've got to remember these people and remember... We, we've got the famous names, but we've got to remember that they used to work the people that came before them that we've never heard of. Quick question, Andy. Go on. November the 9th, somebody's birthday... Somebody very famous. Do you know whose birthday it is? Mine? Is it? Oh, okay. Then well done. Congratulations. You got that. No, it's one. not. No, it's, no, not. it's okay. um it's actually Carl Sagan's birthday. Uh, so the S is for yes. Carl uh, Sagan. Oh. As in ah, Carl Sagan. Right. He now if uh, on November the 9th this year, it would have been his 87th birthday. Um, oh, that happy close birthday, to Carl. It. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Yeah, God bless Whoever you. you are. Um, he died in 1996, unfortunately. He was born in 1934, died in 1996. Now, he's the reason I, I chose Carl Sagan is he's one of my heroes. He's I've got to um basically thank him along with others like Patrick Moore and things like that. But this is the person, one of the persons who really inspired me to um look at science, look at uh, astronomy. Uh, the, in studying the night sky and everything. Um, it was watching his, uh, the, the cosmos, if you remember. Indeed. Um, and he had such a style of talking, um, explanation, explaining things. And he was a straightforward shoot from the hip guy, but he was never 
uh, malicious, never um, no. condescending. No, no. Um, and he actually uh, talked about everything as regards um, the earth, um, society as it stands, uh, politics, war. He even dabbled in cannabis. Um, and uh, he, but he was uh, such a, a, a great explainer of uh, theories and things like that. Um, and uh, he, he looked at everything. He was one of these people who could talk about any subject and uh, bring you to some sort of understanding or make you think outside the box. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is I'll give you just a quick brief rundown of his actual life. I, I, should um, point, I should point out, Daz, at this point, that he's he, he's one of my heroes as well. In yeah. fact, I, I don't think you, you could be an astronomer uh, these days without having Sagan as one of your heroes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, Carl Sagan, Patrick Moore, two fantastic popularizers of, of science. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and Sagan had a way with words that was and maybe still is unmatched in 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 the way that he communicated yeah it was it was he was never sort of like a, a great showman or anything like that he'd he'd just sit on a chair in the middle of the stage mm. um answering questions there was no theatrics no waving of arms or things like that and he was quite humorous as well yes he was some of his speeches he was um, he was he had a wicked sense of humor yeah, and very dry, uh, very dry sense of humor. Yeah, um, so I'll just read through this quickly. It's only a short, short uh, bit, but okay. uh, uh, because I want to get more onto some of the things that, um, you know, some of more of us, it, what he actually said. Mm. Uh, Carl Sagan, 1934 to 1996, played a leading role in the American space program for its from its very beginning. He was there, he was at NASA. From yes. the inception of NASA. In, indeed he was. Yeah. Uh, he was a consultant and advisor to NASA beginning in the 1950s. He briefed the Apollo astronauts before their flights to the moon. Carl was born in New York City on November the 9th, 1934. He describes himself as a childhood science fiction addict who became fascinated by astronomy when he learned that every star in the sky was a distant sun. Mm. Uh, he was always encouraged by his parents to research uh, answers to his innumerable questions about science. His scientific curiosity led him to earn four degrees in physics, astronomy, and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. In his role as a visiting scientist at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in Pasadena, California, um, Carl helped design and manage the Mariner 2 mission to Venus and Mariner 9 uh, and Viking 1 and Viking 2 trips to Mars. The, uh, the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2 missions to the outer solar system and the Galileo mission to Jupiter. Yeah. Carl's research helped to solve the mysteries of the high temperature of Venus, a massive greenhouse effect. Um, the seasonal changes on Mars, wind-blown dust, uh, and the reddish haze of Titan, complex organic molecules. Uh, Carl, Carl was often described as the scientist who made the universe clearer to the ordinary person. He helped to popularize science through the writing of hundreds of articles and over two dozen books. He won a Pulitzer Prize in 1975 for his book, The Dragons of Eden. Oh, yes. His television series, Cosmos, was one of the most watched shows in public television history. It was seen by more than 500 million people in 60 different countries. Wow. Yeah, so he, he lot reached a lot of people. Didn't a lot he? of people there, yeah. yeah. Uh, Carl taught and conducted research at Harvard University. In 1968, Carl became a professor at Cornell University, where he was also the director of laboratory uh, for planetary studies. Um, he was well known as a pioneer in the field of exobiology, uh, which is the study of the possibility of extraterrestrial life. He was among the first to determine that life could have existed on Mars, and he constantly appealed to NASA to extend its exploration of the universe. Uh, with Lewis Freeman and Bruce Murray, Carl founded the Planetary Society, a public membership organization in 1980, 
which inspires, informs, and involves the public in the wonders of space exploration. Nice. The, or the organization is also instrumental in influencing government, uh, dis government decisions regarding spaceflight funding through its grassroots campaigns. Carl was one of the greatest intellects behind the genius of space exploration uh, generally and specifically the Galileo mission, uh, said Dr. Torrance Johnson, a Galileo mission, team, a Galileo mission team member. He was part of the original group that got together to promote the mission to NASA and he served as an interdisciplinary scientist on the mission team uh, from the beginning. He was a great human being who shared with everyone his excitement about the exploration of the universe. Carl suffered from a rare bone marrow disease called myelodyspecia. Uh, complications oh, yeah. from the disease, uh, from this disease, caused uh, the pneumonia, which ended his life on December the twentieth, nineteen ninety-six. He was sixty-two when he died. He was a great loss, very, very much so, a great loss. Uh, and just reading that, you could tell he was highly thought of, um, and still is. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, what I really want to have a quick uh, scanner is uh, I've got 30 pages of quotes that I'd like to read to you. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, I hope you're you, joking. If you go online um, and uh, you can find uh, lots of, about, look at Carl Sagan and there's lots of things, uh, writings about him. And one of the best ones is... Um, you can use a list of his quotes. Uh, can I just stop um, you before you, you get on to yeah. that? Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, the original Cosmos series had pulled in around, what was it, 500 million viewers? By, uh, 500 million viewers, if I remember rightly. Yeah. yeah. Well, the sequel to that, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, Cosmos, a space-time odyssey series, uh, that after the first episode, that was projected to reach about 40 million people um, across the world. Um, so, you know, a huge drop. And I think it, I think it's indicative of, of how um, it's indicative of how TV has changed and how people's tastes have changed. And uh, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's when 50 years after the nearly 50 years after the original Cosmos series that science programs don't pull in those massive figures like they used to in the days of cosmos so um so that's a bit sad uh but yeah. nonetheless i mean um, neil degrasse tyson's follow-up the two series of it that they've been have been have been really good i've really enjoyed them but they're not pulling in the stupendous vig uh, viewing figures that the uh, the original cosmos series is which, which is a bit of a shame anyway that's just an aside uh, so I'll let you carry on with your your quoting, Carl Sagan. Uh, yeah, I'm um, sorry about that. Uh, it's probably the people trying to tell me I've got COVID. Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go through them. But one I would love to read for you, and I've put the sticker in the wrong place because I can't find it. Uh, right, here we go. And, and everybody remembers that Carl Sagan was involved with the plaques on the uh was it the pioneers was it yes um, and yeah. the the gold discs on uh the voyager that's uh, right missions. and um of course it, carl sagan actually wrote a um a book called the pale blue dot uh, yes. because what he did is he convinced and he had to fight for it mm. he had to convince nasa to turn voyager one i think it was um, around and he wanted to take a family portrait of all the um the planets path. yeah from uh, the edge of uh, our um, solar system uh, and eventually they they did it and they took pictures and when they looked uh, at the 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 earth one it was actually caught in a sunbeam yes and uh, you can see this very very uh pale tiny dot. blue dot yeah yeah and uh in his book, he wrote about it and how he, he felt. And basically, it was, it's very mind uh, thought provoking. Um, and basically, it says, it, he says in it, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That is us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you, you ever heard of, 
Every human being who ever lived, ever was, lived their lives, uh, out, uh, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and every coward, every creator and every de destroyer of civilization, every king and every peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and every father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. That's wonderful, isn't it? The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena, Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become a momentary master of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants on one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable uh, inhabitants of some other corner. How frequently their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent are their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all, <clears throat> in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbour life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes, settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. Isn't that and, wonderful? What a writer, yeah, eh? What a writer. Yeah. And he concludes by saying, it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of the human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores the, our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. I mean, I don't know about you, that sends shivers down my spine it's, every time I it, hear it's it. It's remarkably moving, isn't it? Even all these years later, well, everything he says is still absolutely true. Exactly. I mean, he dealt with every, um, you know, the, the, he realised back in the 60s and 70s that we were on a course to destroy this planet. Mm, and he's, and he um, basically he spoke about it and said, we've got to really rethink well, basically, we've got to really rethink, rethink civilization, I and mean, we've got yeah. to uh, start to appreciate each other, um, and basically working together to save humanity, because as we know, this dot isn't going to be here forever. No, absolutely. and if humanity is to survive, then we've got to sort ourselves out, stop the petty bickering, and uh, move on and uh, outwards and help each other. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely, definitely. But yes, it, it does. Like I said, it makes it. I, I've got a whole swathe of them that I've got. Um, about uh, that, uh, about that image of the Earth caught in a, a sunbeam. Um, I believe it was Carolyn Porco who was uh, on the Cassini imaging team, who's, who's a fantastic organizer of imaging and um, and designer of imaging systems. And she said that when she first saw that image, somebody sent it to her as a printed photograph. Obviously, yeah. in those days, we used to have printed photographs in those days. And, uh, and just a note saying, look at the earth in this picture. And she looked at it and she couldn't see it. And then she said she, she brushed her hand across the photo to remove a speck of dust and realized that it wasn't a speck of dust. The actual, <laughs> that was it. That was, yeah. the, that was the, the tiny, tiny speck that was the earth. Uh, taken from Voyager from the edge of the solar system, suspended, as, as Sagan said, in a, in a sunbeam. And there's no more humbling uh, description of things than that. And, yeah, uh, and I'm, yeah. you know, we should all be glad that NASA gave in and, and let Sagan um, use, the, use the science time to take, that, to take that image. Because there was a risk, because they had to turn Voyager right round, you know, it, it's it's you know, it's not easy turning a space. No, exactly. Yeah, you, you have to write all the command sequences. You have to program everything, upload it, check it, run it, 
Um, so, you know, it's it, even such a simple thing. It sounds something, oh, just, let's just turn this baby around. I mean, they do it in things like Star Trek all the time. Yeah. <laughs> with, without any <laughs> effect, terrible. apparently, with, with, with absolutely no existence of G-forces. However, that's another story. Uh, so it really is a humbling thing to, to, to look at anyway. So, uh, so there we are. Yeah. Uh, Sagan, uh, Sagan was good, though, at self-promotion. It has to be yeah. said. Yeah. In fact, I remember reading an article, it could have been in Newsweek or one of the American uh, publications, it was actually entitled The Relentless Self-Promotion of Carl Sagan. He was very good at getting himself into the right places with the right people. And he never did that. Um, well, some people say, you know, he was very egotistical and he thought a lot of himself. I never, I never found that with Sagan. Somebody that can write something like you've just read, yeah, yeah. obviously, is not an egotist because that's incredibly um, humbling and shows a lot of humility. But um, I think he, you know, he he always said that that you know he has to he has to get across to people, and if it means you know, talking to the right people to get in a certain place um, and do, doing the right things to publicize himself, then why the hell not? It got his message across. Uh, as you said, the, the Cosmos series got that message across to 500 million people. And uh, I remember watching it in the 70s and we were just enthralled. Every single episode was just, was yeah, just exactly, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, Mind yeah. you, I mean, I've got, I've got it on DVD. I will say what is amazing about Cosmos is how primitive the graphics were. We forget how primitive the graphics yeah. were. For example, there's an episode where he wanted to show the inside of a, of a human cell, and it was a painting. It was an actual painting of the inside of a human cell. Now we'd have a, you know, we'd have an image of it, an actual picture yeah. of the inside of the cell. So, um, you know, with incredibly what we would call now primitive technology, he created a masterpiece of television. He really did. Yes, he certainly did. I mean, he is his quote. I mean, a lot of things that he said are just, you know, here's another one. Astronomically, the USSR and the United States are the same place. Well, yes, they are. Well, yes, this was this, yes, on this year. Um, and it also, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. <laughs> yeah. so, yes, it's, it's, absolutely. You know, it's, absolutely. it's true. Yeah, and uh, matter is composed well, chiefly of nothing. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And and you know, I've always thought, on a philosophical note, that seeing that pale blue dot, that tiny speck of dust in the cosmos, um. And then to realize that it's actually divided up with artificial lines that we call national boundaries. Yeah. How ridiculous yeah. the whole thing is. And, and it, it, it does mention that here, someone. Um, and he uh, says, all these borders, which cannot be seen from space. They yeah, don't exactly. exist. Exactly. They're not actually there. And, um, and of course, when the internet became popular, one of the reasons government tried to squash it so much um, was that they didn't want people from one country talking to people in another country. Because if they were ever asked to go to war against the people in those countries, they might turn around and say, I'm not going to war against him. He's my friend. I talked to him on the internet. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Governments have always seen the internet as, as a threat because it encourages people to be human, basically, and, and, and talk yeah. to each other rather, right. rather than being goaded into, into fighting you know, for whatever stupid reason, because wars are only ever fought over stupid reason. Exactly. I and mean, it's you following on that lines about wars is that every one of us is in the in the cosmic perspective precious. If a human disagrees with you, let him live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another. So yeah, you know, it's just true. true. It's something simple like that. And because he always spoke about the stupidity of having thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons when you don't need that many no, and that's you know, right. is, is it why you know is it's just who's got the biggest arsenal and things it's, like it's that. enough it's to completely continuous. destroy the world many times over you only yeah. need to do it once for goodness sake to make your point um yeah. but and incidentally his two billion galaxies we now know it's it's 100 sorry 100 billion galaxies i think yeah. he said. it's now two trillion galaxies but he he but in the, but I think of the hundred billion galaxies, he didn't actually say that it's a misquote and it's been 
Oh, um, really? used time yeah. and time again uh, right. Um, right. because it was actually one of the uh, hosts uh, um, talk show hosts that mm. came up with that he said he never actually said it but uh, it, it, he's used it later as I said in this one um, and one just another one on the, the futility of war we have heard the rationales offered by the nuclear superpowers we know who speaks for the nations but who speaks for the human species who speaks for earth yeah so it's things like it's things that you know really provoke thought thought provoke yeah yeah and he like he was a master at, at uh provoking thought he really was yeah. and sorely missed now what i reckon you said you had how many pages of those quotes i've Lots. got about 30 of them yeah right i have an idea um this is to do with guerrilla gardening you know guerrilla gardening where people sneak onto um bit, bits of open ground in the middle of uh, dual carriageways yeah, in, the yeah, and, and uh, in the middle garden. of the night and, and garden it and plant things. <laughs> yeah. Well, you want me to I, put posters up? <laughs> no, no, no. No, I've had a better idea. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call it guerrilla saganism. Okay. Uh, okay. Then. Uh, what you should do, print those out, yeah. cut them up onto strips of paper individually, make some fortune cookies, put them inside and <laughs> sneak into your local Chinese and leave these fortune cookies everywhere. So that instead of, um, you know, instead of in, uh, opening a fortune cookie and seeing you're going to meet a tall, dark stranger, it'll have a quote from Sagan. What about that as an idea? Guerrilla Sagan. Well, it could be because actually my partner works in a Chinese restaurant. Oh, really? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. I think we have a plan. <laughs> jobs, jobs are good, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll start our own cult. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Saganism. Saganism, yeah. absolutely. But, um, well, it's no more, no more ridiculous yeah. than most other cults. But it is, when you, you read these, they're just quotes from his books, from uh, his speeches. And I would recommend people go online. Um, and there's a, a if, if you go on YouTube uh, and look up Carl Sagan's Lost Lecture, um, it's about two hours long. Yeah. Um, there's even a, a question uh, answer and question thing at the end, but go and have a look at it. To, you know, get yourself a coffee, sit down, have a look at it, and just listen to what the chap has to say and how he also deals with the questions, uh, especially about religion and things like that. He his rash basically most of his rationale was with, if you're going to make a statement, show me the proof. Yes, absolutely. He said, where is the proof? Um, and you, you've got to prove it. But he does. It's not dismissive of people believing in God. Um, he said, if you believe that uh, the universe and everything in the universe and the wonders of the universe are made by some deity, then that could be your God. He said, yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, to actually say a, a gray old man sat in a big chair watching over us, he said, show me the proof. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, so, the, yes, the, can... the other thing I'd like to recommend is his book, The Demon ha Haunted... The, sorry, I'm so sorry, I'll say that again. The Demon Haunted World, mm -hmm. in which he predicted the rise of conspiracy... Conspiracy... I can't get my yeah. teeth into that. Conspiracy theories um, and uh, and the, the regression of intellect that we're seeing... Yeah in places like the United States, where it's getting incredibly worrying. And um, he predicted all this and said that, you yeah. know, um, TV, everything is dumbing down. People are going to end up just automatons, not able yeah. to think. And we're seeing all this now. And, you know, he yeah. was predicting this nearly 50 years can ago. I, can I just stop you there? And I can actually read you what he actually said. Oh, please, wish. please do. Yes, love to yeah. hear it. Um, as... as uh... Uh, you said it's Carl Sagan from The Demon Haunted World, and he wrote it in 1995. And it says, science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. I have foreboding of an America, uh, America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and an information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries when awesome techno technological powers are in the hands of a very few, mm -hmm. and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or acknowledgeably questioning those in authority, when clutching, uh, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties 
in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide almost without noticing back into this into superstition and darkness. So yes, that was exactly what you were just talking about. Absolutely. uh, And that was oh that was a bit later than I thought, 1995. I must reread that book, read it a long time ago. Yeah. Well worth the read. Carl Sagan, The Demon Haunted World. Yeah, it's just one of those things. And like I said, he he, as you said, he foretold mm. what uh, what, what we, America, we are actually seeing to yeah. do today, yeah, and uh, especially in America, it's all coming true. Yeah. Anyway, so we, I, I think we could talk about him all night. Yeah, we could we could go on a lot about Carl Sagan, yeah. but he is. I think he deserves his own program. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, then there's a thought. There's a thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. So. Um, I love your program about hail, by the way. That was that was very oh, good. good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That was uh... yeah, that was good. Uh, Daz is astronomy, and very interesting. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's part of my just, uh, standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, yeah, and it was very good, Daz. Anyway, um, yeah. enough back back slapping you. for you for the moment. Yeah. And this is the amazing astronomical alphabet. S is for serious, as in you cannot be. And uh, yeah, serious. Some people pronounce it serious. I've even heard people pronounce it serious, but it is actually spelled S I R I U S. As you may know, Sirius is the uh, brightest star in the sky. In Greek, Sirius means, do you know what it means in Greek, Daz? Um, not offhand. It means scorching. Oh, okay. Then. Yeah, scorching. Actually, that, was, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, another possible translation in Greek is glowing, but uh, but the main one that people think it means is is scorching, and people assume that because it was so bright, it was so very very hot, and therefore scorching. They didn't know how far away it was, of course, nor its size. Yeah. It's also known as the dog star, um, which <laughs> uh, you know, that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and it's the brightest star in the sky apart from the sun. Do you know the second brightest as? Mm. What after the sun? Yeah, no, after after Sirius. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, is it Rigel? No, it's Canopus. Canopus. Yeah, yeah. Canopus. Never mind. Uh, Sirius is in now. the constellation uh, Canis Major, the great dog, hence the dog star. Yeah. Uh, it's a main sequence star. It's about seventy times more luminous than the sun, seventy times brighter than the sun. And it's about 8.6 light years away. Now, it's got an apparent magnitude in, in the sky when you see it of minus 1.46. So it is, you know, bright. Uh, but its absolute magnitude is uh, plus 1.4. It's not alone, though. It has a companion star known, not surprisingly, given that Sirius is the dog star. Its companion is known as the pup. But that was discovered relatively recently because it's a white dwarf and it's a white dwarf of spectral type DA2. And it's it's been named rather unimaginatively Sirius B. (laughs) Now, the distance between the two stars varies enormously because it varies between 8.2 and 31.5 astronomical units. One astronomical unit, of course, being the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So to think that the, the two stars at their closest come only eight times the Earth-Sun uh, distance. I've got a feeling that Jupiter's about eight astronomical units. I may be wrong about that. Maybe yeah. completely wrong about that. It's somewhere around there. Uh, so um, so that's, that's, uh, that's it. Now, it had in, a significance historically because it is the brightest star in the sky it marked the flooding of the nile in ancient egypt um so um so uh it also marked the dog days of summer for the ancient greeks the polynesians mostly in the southern hemisphere for them it marked winter and they used it as a beacon for their navigation around the pacific ocean because when the sky is clear you can't really miss it so uh, that's quite interesting. Um, now, um, Sirius B has been found to have, uh, it's, it's about the diameter of the Earth, Sirius B. And uh, it's about seven and a half thousand miles or 12,000 kilometers in diameter. But if you think something the size of the Earth, 
it because it's a white dwarf it has an enormous amount of material and its mass is 102 percent that of the sun so give or take it's about the same mass as the sun so if you can imagine the sun which is nearly a million miles across compressed to the size of the earth then you have an idea about how dense a a, a, a white dwarf star is now interestingly um there is an historical uh, oddity about Sirius. So if I were to say to you, Daz, what colour is Sirius? What would you say? Um, Sirius, I would say white blue. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so white I. bluish. Yeah, yeah blue, uh, bluish blue. white, brilliantly yeah. bluish white. Yeah. But more, more white than blue, probably white with a tinge of blue. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, history disagrees with us. Uh, or at least some people of history disagree with us. For example, Ptolemy, which we know uh, created the Almagest, his, his, his star maps, uh, divided into many books. And in books seven and eight uh, of his Almagest, he um, used Sirius as the location for his globe central meridian. So he put Sirius as a meridian. Oh, okay, then, yeah. He, in the Armageddon, described Sirius as being red. Now, the poet Aratus, the orator Cicero, and the famous general Germanicus, also in history, described Sirius as being red. And there's an, 80, uh, there's an 8th century Lombardic manuscript, which contains um, a piece of writing by St. Gregory of Tours called De cursu stellarum ratio, and I'm probably pronouncing that Latin entirely wrongly, for which I apologise to any Latin scholars. Um, and uh, this was a, a piece of writing that told the faithful how to determine the time for nighttime prayers going by the location of the stars. And a bright star was described in that as rubeola, which means reddish, and it's been claimed to be serious. However, it could well have been Arcturus, which makes more sense because Arcturus is red. Uh, the first century poet Marcus Manilius describes Sirius as sea blue, which I think we can agree it isn't, not unless you've got a weird sea. Uh, but the fourth century writer uh, Avianus described it as sea blue as well. In ancient China, it was white. And uh, various records um, from the 2nd century BC up to the 7th century AD all describe Sirius uh, as white in China. And uh, so there is this uh, sort of anomaly in history that some people have described it as red. Some people have even gone so far as to say that all those centuries ago, Sirius was a red giant, which, of course, is nonsense yeah. um, because it's a main sequence star. It hasn't. Uh, yet reach the uh, the red giant phase and even if it had uh, the evidence of it would be there and it couldn't possibly transition from a, a red giant to a white star in just a few centuries so that's that's complete nonsense unfortunately the last thing i want to say about sirius is that voyager 2 we mentioned the voyagers earlier which was launched in 1977 yeah. as we know is expected to pass within 4.3 light years of sirius in a few years, yeah. do you know how many years uh, that's going to be? It's probably a few thousand. 296,000 to be precise. Yeah, I said a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in about 300,000 years, humanity's spacecraft Voyager 2 will pass within 4.3 light years of Sirius. Incidentally, that 4.3 light year figure may ring a bell because it's the distance from the sun to Proxima Centauri. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be the same distance as uh, from Sirius as Proxima Centauri is from us. From so, us. yeah. So Maybe. there we are. Now, and that's Sirius. I thought it was quite interesting how there was this or disagreeing about what colour it was because it's clearly brilliantly blue-white. Blue and white, yeah. It's a very what? hot star, a hot young yeah. star. So One of my favourite games with uh, Sirius is when it's uh, in the sky and you've got a bit of uh, turbulence, is if you look at it, even with the eye, if you just sort of like deflect your sight away, it twinkles in different colours. Right. And one of the, the my favourite tricks is to put the camera on a long exposure yeah, and then on a tripod and then just keep tapping, gently tapping it. And uh -huh. what happens is, is you will find 
that uh, you get a, a lovely so look, do you remember the spiral like spiral that's thing, right yeah? that's right um and you you get all the colors and it is it's basically it's all the colors of the spectrum and that is light being uh, diffracted by the actual atmosphere as it comes comes through because yeah, yeah. it is one of the brightest stars yeah, also yeah. um you mentioned um Sirius A and Sirius B but actually in the whole system the Sirius system there is one two three Oh yeah, there are multiple five stars. stars. That's, yeah, right. that's right. And that's right. You, you, there was um, I'm just trying to work out uh, because you've got because you mentioned Exelanthia, didn't you? No. Oh, didn't you? Oh, there's because no. Sirius B is actually orbiting another star, and it looks like a dead star. It's called Sirius C, and uh, then. Uh, so if you imagine there's a black star in the middle, it could even be a black hole, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a smaller uh, star mm -hmm. called Exlanthia, which is uh, circling close to this dark star. Then Sirius is actually uh, orbiting around the two of those. Right. Then you've got the dog star on a even further out orbit mm -hmm. with its own little... Um, uh, companion uh, orbiting it so uh it's a complicated it's, system, it's a right? complicated system yeah, and of yeah. course there is and i think I, I think it's considered an urban myth now there was um a tribe and i think it was something like indonesia or something like this people can correct me if they wish hmm. uh, called the dogeons oh, yes. and when they were um discovered uh when they were found in the jungles or whatever they had a oral history of um they were sort of like educated um by these very strange beings that were very tall and they had fish-like heads really uh yes and they um wore strange uh did uniforms. they wear cod pieces <laughs> yeah well they probably did yeah, and kipper ties um and um but they said that they and what what they did is they gave them an oral history and they t said that um they came from sirius and they told the tribe that sirius was a binary star system right um, and of course, this was before that series. Of course, everybody poo pooed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was a few years later that uh, Sirius B was actually discovered. Wow. So um, I think it's uh, been considered to be an urban myth now. Uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. That that, that um, has a, a fish like, a rotting uh, fish like stench of urban myth about tad. it, doesn't it? I mean, I, I yeah. can remember reading it in, back in sort of like the 80s and things like that when you had all these different. That, that sounds but like. But it was. But it was, a, it was a tale, like I say, about about Sirius, and uh, yeah. they, these people told the the uh, the people who had uh, discovered their the tribe that Sirius was a, a double star, and a few years later it was supposed to have been discovered. But as I said, that's probably an urban myth. But uh, well, I think I think I might be able to pinpoint uh, the origin of that urban myth. The the, the three words Eric von Darnik can come to mind. That sounds like yeah. a typical thing that. Von Darnigan might invent as he invented everything else. Um, yeah, if uh, our listeners who don't know who Eric Von Darnigan was, back in the 70s, he wrote a very, very successful series of books claiming that um, God was an astronaut, Earth had been visited by extraterrestrials in prehistory, and, uh, and they have left their mark. They built the pyramids and ley lines, and God knows what other hippie junk he threw into this. And uh, but he made himself a very rich man uh, by coming up with this nonsense. And um, a lot of people believed it hook, line and sink. A lot of people still do. But when people talk to me about Eric von Daniken and his theories about ancient aliens, um, I always just say to them, well, did you know that he wrote the first book while he was in prison for fraud? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that tells you something about the degree of the man's scientific integrity, certainly. So, um, yeah. so there oh, we are. This, yeah, sorry, these people were from uh, Mali in West Africa. Oh, right. Um, and uh, the, the race was called the Nomas. Try, uh, were called the Nomas. Right. And they visited her from the, the Sirius 
uh, thousands of years ago. Um, but uh, nice. yeah, I'm trying to see if I can see. Yeah, so yeah, it's 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 you know it's, it's whether or not you want to uh, believe it or not. Oh. It, uh, it doesn't actually say here that it's a a, a, a joke or a, a made. No, um, uh, um, no, but it, who um, knows? Hey, it's in Wikipedia, so it's got to be right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it has to be right. As, as Carl Sagan would have said, does show me the evidence. Have you ever heard? Well, you must have heard of it. But I don't know where I heard it. A solar nebula. Um, so S is for solar nebula. Nebula. S is for solar nebula. No, yeah. I don't think I have that. You'll probably know it more as a planetary disk. Oh, um, right. okay, fair but enough. it's it's also it's, it's it's the evolution of a whole a complete solar system. Right. Um. Right. So, uh, what it is it, from the formation of the the actual star and the planets that revolve that will eventually um orbit the actual star. They're made from the the what we would like to say normally we call a planetary disk, mm. um, and of course we've you know just recently um, maybe discovered another planet around a star in um, the Whirlpool Galaxy as you uh, mentioned. Yes, absolutely, show. absolutely, yes, very good show. And and also I'm going to say damn you because I now know what Pat Metheny looks like and I was able to pre- <laughs> name the the. Uh, <laughs> did you enjoy? Who, the, did you the, enjoy the playlist, Daz? I, I did very much so. Uh, ah, good. Yeah, you see, uh, me, I, I told you, fingers. I told you, I'd convert you to Pat Metheny. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> well, no, because I was, I was, I was, <laughs> I was listening to it, and I said, "Bloody!" I said, "He really plays that Pat, Pat Metheny. You must really like him." Yeah. And my, my partner said, "Oh, yeah, it, it does go on a bit though." And I said, "Yeah." I said, I "See," I said, "You know what I mean." And she said, <laughs> "Yeah, but it's still better than the crap you listen to." <laughs> <laughs> I really must meet your partner. <laughs> <laughs> she says. Yes. Lady of uh, after my own heart. <laughs> anyway, um, I, was, I just get so we're back back to solar nebula. So <laughs> as we said, I said it's 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 um what we call protoplanetary disk really. Um, so uh, if, if we, uh, the formation and evolution of um, our solar system began four point five billion years ago with a gravitational collapse of a small part of a giant molecular cloud. Mm. Most of the collapsing mass collected in the center forming the sun, while the rest flattened into a protoplanetary disk out of which the planets, moons, asteroids and other small solar system bodies formed. This model is known as the nebular hypothesis uh, and was first developed in the 18th century by Immanuel Swedenborg, Immanuel Kant and Pierre Simon. Laplace. Oh, uh, Laplace, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and Immanuel Kant as well. That was illustrious yeah, company, wasn't it? Immanuel Kant, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very big uh, names in there. Absolutely. Uh, its, its subsequent development was interwoven with a variety of scientific disciplines, including astronomy, chemistry, geology, physics, and planetary science, which is quite obvious. Hmm. Since the dawn of, of the space age in the 1950s, and the discovery of extrasolar planets in the 1990s, the model has been both challenged and refined to account for new observations. Uh, The solar system has evolved considerably since its initial formation. Many moons have formed from circling disks of gas and dust around their planets, parent planets, while other moons are thought to have formed independently and later to have been captured by their planets. Still others, such as Earth's moon, may have been the result of giant collisions. Sure. So we're back to the uh, the Thea uh, hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Collisions between bodies have occurred continually up to the present day and have been uh, central to the evolution of the solar system. The position of the planets might have shifted due to gravita- gravitational interactions. Uh, this planetary migration is now thought to have been responsible for much of the solar system's early evolution. In roughly five billion years, the sun will... Oh, this is, oh, this is doom and gloom. In roughly five <laughs> billion years, the sun will cool and expand outward to many times its current diameter, becoming a red giant, before casting off its uh, outer layers as a planetary nebula and leaving behind a stellar remnant known as a white dwarf. Right. Uh, in the far distant future, uh, uh, in the far distant future, the gravity 
of uh, passing stars will gradually reduce the sun's retinue of planets. Some planets will be destroyed, others ejected into interstellar space. Ultimately, over the course of 10 of billions of years, it is um, likely that the sun will be left with none of its original bodies in the orbit around it. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, oh, that's and, and this thing about the, the sun becoming a red giant and swallowing up the Earth, uh, it's quite interesting because nobody really knows if it will swallow the Earth. And one yeah. of the reasons is that, of course, the Earth, the Earth's orbit, like all orbits, is decaying over time. And the Earth is steadily getting uh, further away from the sun. So whether in a few billion years it will be so far away that the red giant that our sun will become won't swallow it, uh, <clears throat> nobody really knows. Uh, so um, it's going to be, I would say, very interesting to see. I'll exactly, know. yeah. <laughs> we because, won't actually uh, be here to see it. but uh. I, I think we had a discussion. I, I, I brought up the question of as the sun um, expanded, what would happen to the outer uh, planets? And I think yes. we, we discussed it on um, Reach Out and Touch Space. Yes, we did. The fact that they and, will warm uh, up and, and, and perhaps uh, yeah. life, if it hasn't by then, will get started with with a warmer environment. Yeah. So but we, it, we, we it, shouldn't it, write it, off the possibility of life existing even in, on places like Titan. No, and exactly. Earth, yeah. Which yeah, are we, incredibly cold. Yeah, we uh, might have to share a planet or a moon. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wonder what humans will be like. Well, we won't be human. Then evolution will have changed us into um, yeah. mil, uh, Millwall fans or something like that. Or jelly. Uh, or jelly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but, yeah. but there we are. Interesting to think but that's, about. That's what a solar nebula is. It's... Yeah. Um, Basically, the, the the a nebula which actually produces, uh, because we we do see these um, uh, in uh, with these solar nebula things forming, and we see several of them in um, the Orion Nebula, and yes, they look they, like um, little like peanut shaped things, and uh, they're they're, they're, and they're, they're technically called Bock globules. That's it. I couldn't remember the yeah, name. Yeah, Bock Bock B O C K Bock globules. That's what yeah, Bock glob. It's a lovely term. It is, it isn't it? Like, it yeah, looks like so. something you need cream for. <laughs> so, uh... Oh, I've got a bad case of bot globules, doctor. <laughs> mm, I, I've got something that might fix that. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, <over. it's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, this, yeah well, okay, we won't go no, no, no. with that. But yes, it's um, but that's what they are. It, it's it, a solar um, a solar nebula is uh, basically a planetary disk, but is before the formation of the sun. And it goes on to form a solar system all of its own. And well, we have seen them in other places. So. And interestingly, over the last few years, the exquisitely sensitive ALMA radio telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile has come up with some amazing radio images of these protoplanetary disks where you can clearly see the lanes being carved out yeah. of dust by, yeah. by uh, newly born planets. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I come up against some religious people occasionally saying, you know, uh, God made the planets, God made, well, God made everything. And I just point them to these images. I said, well, that's physics at work. No, no deity necessary there. We know what the processes that are going on. It's all gravity. If there's one God in the universe, it should be gravity because gravity is the architect and the sculptor of the universe. Uh, so, you know, we, we should all open the church of gravity. Along, yeah, with that, exactly. along with our Saganism cult. Saganism cult, yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, like you say, it's, because um, like, I think you mentioned, your, was it X-ray we discovered that um, uh, planet? Around yes, it, yes, it was, um, it, it, it was fortuitous because mm. it's an X-ray binary that emits quite a lot of X-rays. And it suddenly dipped in brightness because something, we assume a planet, um cut the x-rays off from as seen from the earth oh, uh, nice. um it was a momentary um not just a drop a complete absence of the the, the x-rays were interrupted by something coming between us and the um the object emitting the x-rays which we assume is a black hole and um this is not likely to happen too often because of course that planet would have to be in exactly the right plane in line of sight from the earth yeah. Uh, uh, if if it were in another plane orbiting its star, 
then uh, you know it wouldn't it wouldn't do it. So this is not likely to be a common common occurrence. But the fact that we have potentially dis it's yet to be confirmed, but the fact that we have potentially discovered a planet in another galaxy is quite mind blowing. It when only cool, just it? it's very cool, extremely cool. But only less than thirty years ago, we'd never discovered planets at all orbiting any other stars in any galaxy, let alone another one. So um, yeah, so that's, that's amazing. There we are then. Sweet. Yep. So that uh, yeah. was solar solar nebula. But, yeah. yeah. So um, so um, I'm going to move on now. And my next one, if I were to say to you, Daz, soft gamma, soft gamma, soft gamma, soft gamma, soft gamma, what would I be? Um, some uh, pork joints. No, I would be a soft gamma repeater. So, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so, S is for soft gamma repeater, and uh, this is this is quite short. It doesn't need much explanation. So, this is probably a type of star known as a magnetar. Now, these are highly magnetic neutron stars we've discussed before, but uh, if you didn't hear that, they are highly magnetized neutron stars. And they have magnetic fields trillions of times stronger than the Earth's. If we had a magnetar at the distance of the moon, it would pull the keys out of your pocket or wipe your credit cards. I mean, you know, the magnetic field of a magnetar is insanely strong. Why does it get so strong? Well, we don't really know. We think it's something to do with the, um, the rotation rate of the star that collapsed to form the magnetar, sort of a conservation of uh, energy, uh, conservation momentum thing, um, which somehow generates an incredible magnetic field, but we don't really know. And there've only been 23 magnetars yet discovered, but they, they are also a prime suspect for the uh, enigmatic and mysterious fast radio bursts, these radio bursts coming from all over the sky that last maybe a thousandth of a second, but in that thousandth of a second, there's more energy than the sun uh, radiates in a whole year. So they are incredibly energetic events. Magnetars are one candidate because uh, up until quite recently, we'd only ever discovered magnetars in other galaxies. And we actually uh, detected one um, in our own galaxy, a fast radio burst. And it turned out to be from a magnetar, but it doesn't mean to say that all fast radio bursts are magnetars. And indeed, most astronomers think that they might have different, different causes. And um, anyway, so what a soft gamma repeater is, is a magnetar that emits uh, regular bursts, uh, sorry, irregular bursts at, at non-predictable intervals of low energy gamma rays. So instead of radiating X-rays or, or radio waves, these these uh, these um, fire gamma rays at us, and the reason that they do this is thought to be connected with star quakes on the surface of the neutron star. Now, when we say a star quake, uh, don't think of an earthquake. It's nothing as violent as that, because on the surface of a neutron star, because the gravity is so intense unbelievably intense it doesn't allow any structure to rise above its surface by more than about a millimeter so these are probably the most completely spherical smooth objects in existence mm -hmm. because if you did have um, something a millimeter high on a neutron star that that would be classed as a mountain believe it or not and uh, occasionally, well, it's thought this is all theory because, you know, we, we don't really have any much evidence for this. But theory says that what happens is it does develop these tiny, tiny irregularities and the, the crust of the neutron star slips a little bit, only a tiny amount. And that's enough to cause a star quake, which is uh, generating these bursts of gamma rays in the case of soft gamma repeaters. So, um, so there we are. Um, soft gamma repeaters were discovered um, historically fairly recently, only in 1979 were they discovered, but astronomers now know of many of them. Um, as I said, we suspect they're caused by very tiny movements of the crust of the neutron star, which is not very thick at all. It may only be a few centimeters thick, um, but that's enough to cause these, these, these gamma ray bursts. But it is all um, speculation, really, because... 
we haven't got any real close neutron stars that we can observe in any great detail, which is, well, perhaps it's not a shame because they're after black holes, they're the most <laughs> dangerous beasts in the cosmos. We don't want to go anywhere near a neutron star. No, don't want to play and, with one of them. And, um, and yeah, so, so there we are. So that's a soft gamma repeater. Okay, then it's amazing what these things, these all these objects out there that are you know we're discovering, and like we said, we're we're making predictions of what they could be, mm. but it's absolutely amazing of all the different types of things. And well, how do, people... do you know? It's funny you should say that. Um, I was thinking exactly this while reading about the the soft gamma repeaters, and uh, just to refresh my memory, and. There's such a variety of animals in the cosmic zoo that mm. that it, it is truly amazing how varied the universe is. But yeah. only a few decades ago, how many objects, types of objects did we know about? Not many. <laughs> Not many at all. No. Not many at all. No. Uh, and now we know of this incredible variety of characteristics, of behaviours, of features. And uh, the universe, you know, um, is, is indeed, as Einstein said, queerer than we can imagine. Uh, so, uh, so there we are. So that's another animal in the cosmic zoo, soft gamma repeater, which fires irregular bursts of gamma rays. Yeah, because it wasn't that long ago we thought our galaxies were part of our galaxy. That's right. Uh, and they were right. they were nebulae, not uh, not not their own island of uh, stars. No, that's oh, right. That's, but like you say, it's, it's just amazing what's what's out there and what. It, there's a lot more to be discovered, and unfortunately, uh, I don't think we'll be around to. Be to, to, to see some of these but well, like I say the, the time we've lived in I mean we've seen man fly into space we've seen man land on the moon we've I have you know, uh, I have no regrets at all about living in this particular window yeah. in history it, it, uh, it, we it's were been phenomenal beginning. it's been yeah. phenomenal and if we're very lucky we may even get to see the first people on Mars before too long yeah hopefully. so um, come on Elon <laughs> well if you think about it Daz um, when New Horizons flew past Pluto, that marked the end of the first stage of the reconnaissance of yeah. the solar system, which had begun exactly 50 years earlier. 1965, uh, Mariner at, at Mars, um, and then 2015, uh, New Horizons at Pluto. And, yeah. and it's sad that it took 50 years to do that, but it was quite an historic event that that. You know, and just in our own solar system, we've seen things that we could yeah. never have imagined. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it, so it's, it's been a great time and to then, be alive. Um, yeah, and they are talking about sending out another big interstellar grand tour uh, probe yeah. at some time. But uh, yeah, mm. fingers crossed. That we well, I was watching the um, the Sky at Night uh, Question Time yesterday which I don't know whether you saw it. Um, I've only just caught up with it. Yeah. And uh, somebody did ask the question, you know, why aren't we sending a probe to the ice giants, Neptune and Uranus? And the answer is that astronomers want to, but there's not enough cash in the pot to do everything yeah. that we need exactly. to do yeah. or would like to do. So very sad because yeah. I'd love to see Neptune again. Um, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I'd even like to see you in this again, which I never yeah, thought I'm say hear myself can, saying, yeah. um, but yeah, just, just, yeah, just get a mirror. You can see it anytime. Yeah, um, that's true. That's true enough. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you. We, um, we had this discussion, didn't we? Um, um, reach out to space, what our mm. next missions would be. And I think the majority of us all said we want need to get out to the ice giants and also the moons. The, well, the, Triton the, is is yeah. suspected of having an underground ocean, like so many other moons in the outer solar system. And uh, its terrain, I mean, if you look at a map of Triton taken from Voyager images, a lot of that map is black. It weren't just, just weren't imaged because it couldn't yeah. because of its trajectory yeah. on its flyby. So very sad that, uh, you know, there's a lot of Triton we don't know about. That, uh, that terrain on Triton is just bizarre, it's sort of cantaloupe. Yeah, uh, 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 it's very odd terrain. Very, very strange, isn't it? Yeah. It's you know, it's 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 different to you know. You might expect at that distance, it might be a little bit like Pluto. Well, it actually has some similarities with Pluto in the fact that we, you know, we, it clearly has got deposits of various ices, uh, you know, nitrogen ice and ammonia ice. Uh, but there's a lot of that terrain that didn't look anything like Pluto. Uh, so it'd be it'd be great yeah. to go back. Anyway, there you are. So. Um, 
I think that's about uh, I think that's about it, isn't it, for today? Does I think? Yes, yeah, so I think that's we haven't got time uh, to, yeah. to start another one. Really. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, you know, I think uh, after a couple yeah. of weeks away from uh, talking about these things, I I could go on yeah. for the next two hours. Uh, yeah. As I'm sure. Well, you okay, could. then off we go. Then I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we 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 ought to do uh, we ought to do a um, a marathon. Uh, at some point and just do a few hours just chatting yeah nothing uh, like mark thompson did though please. no no not going to, <laughs> no, not going to five and a half days no um <laughs> you know i love doing this stuff with a passion but uh that's too much yeah. i hope he's all right by the way i hope he didn't have any long-term ill effects from staying awake for five well, the last days. i heard of him he was, he's doing fine he's almost back oh, to uh, great but that was an amazing achievement um, ah yes in case yeah. uh, the listeners don't know mark thompson uh, broadcaster, writer, TV personality, mm. all round good egg, uh, made an attempt to deliver the longest ever scientific lecture, which was about astronomy. And he stayed awake uh, with just a few breaks for sleeping uh, for five and a half days. And it was a wonderful achievement to raise money for Bernardo's, the children's charity, which he did. So we're all very proud of him at Astro Radio because he's a mm. friend of Astro Radio. And uh, what an amazing achievement. And on that mm. note, we will say... We will be back next time with the slightly more right-angled form of the letter T. And uh, we will be doing that next week. So have a fantastic week, everybody. Stay safe. Be careful out there in the COVID jungle, because uh, especially in the UK, it's definitely a jungle. And uh, and we will talk to you again very soon. Any last thoughts, yeah. Daz? Yes, as, as I just can say exactly the same as Andy. Everybody, please stay safe um and uh look after each other and we'll see you again next week all right then Thanks for the guys and myself thank you so much for listening and uh goodbye